Good evening, everyone. Welcome, friends, to our Astronomy on Tap event for December. This is our final event of 2020. And yeah, it's going to be a super good night. I'm Dr. Cameron Hummels. I will be your host tonight. Um, we don't have Kalen as a co-host tonight. I don't know what he's up to, probably listening to obscure B-sides of prog rock albums or something other other similar activity. But um, yeah, so our Astronomy on Tap tonight is going to be super cool, and it coincides with the Geminid meteor shower that's occurring tonight and occur has been occurring over the, the last couple of nights. I actually look up. I'm, I apologize. I, I feel a bit tired. I've been in Death Valley the last two nights watching uh, stargazing and watching the meteor shower, which was super, super awesome. So, but we'll talk about the meteor shower tonight and um, ways in which you might be able to check it out too tonight, even depending on the cloud cover in your area. Um, just as a couple of announcements, we I haven't put anything on the schedule yet publicly, but we will continue to have these events through uh, 2021, starting in January. We'll have both Astronomy on Tap happening once a month on Monday nights, as well as our stargazing events, our stargazing lecture events happening once a month on Friday nights. Um, I'm gonna modify things and try to actually do some real stargazing during those by getting a telescope that I set up on the roof of my apartment and broadcast a couple of, like finding a couple of things in the sky. Of course, it's here in, uh, in not the greatest skies of Pasadena, California, but it's an experiment. Maybe it's gonna be awesome. Maybe it's gonna be a total failure, but we'll, we'll give it a shot and see how it goes. Uh, you may have seen we released on Friday, I released a bunch of additional YouTube videos on our YouTube channel here uh, that are, are the Caltech Astronomy Colloquia, which is a lecture series that takes place in our department every week. Most academic departments have colloquia. They are scientific talks that are at a really high level. They're given by other scientists who are visiting our department and get, well, in this case, virtually visiting our department through Zoom and they give a presentation on their research. So this is cutting edge research being done, uh, you know, at the moment by leading scientists around the world, but there's a ton of jargon and it's meant for a professional scientist audience. So, uh, so it might be hard to get, I mean, heck, it's hard for us to get stuff in some of the, you know, get the whole gist of what other scientists are talking about when it's not specifically on our area of research. So, um, so, caveat emptor for that, but it could be really cool. Um, you're free to check them out and see if you want to uh, to watch one. They're an hour long each, and then they have some questions afterwards from some of the scientists in our department. So check one out, but if you don't like it, obviously you don't have to listen to it. And we're working on doing some additional stuff to have more um, like public level science talks like, like Astronomy on Tap tonight. If this is your first time, a brief overlay of what we're going to do tonight. I'll have a couple more announcements and then I'll bring in the speakers. I will uh, we'll have a 15 minute talk from one of the speakers and then maybe like five or 10 minutes of Q&A afterwards. And then we'll have a roughly 15 minute talk from our other speaker and then about five to 10 minutes of Q&A after that. And then we'll have pub trivia, which is interactive. We've got this website where you can connect to it and um, answer the questions and then, and your answers as well as everyone else's answers pop up on our screen and we can kind of see how everyone's doing. So it's super fun. And that will probably be the last 45 minutes or hour of our time tonight, but um, yeah. And if you have any other suggestions for either talk topics you'd like to see in the new year or uh, suggestions on ways of improving our events, feel free to reach out to me, Cameron Hummels, um, at uh, chummels, chummels at caltech.edu, or uh, just writing in the comments here on the YouTube, like suggestions, ways in which you think we, we might in, in, like improve our events or, or something new that we might do. So we're open, I'm open to, uh, to new suggestions. Anyway, um, Oriane and Andrew, do you guys wanna come back in here? Hello. Hello. Hi. Awesome. So um, our, our two guests tonight are Oriane Egal 
and Andrew Uden, who are both scientists uh, working in the field of, of the solar system and, and, and planetary, uh, planetary research, amongst other things. But um, this is a, an astronomy on tap that's really meant to commemorate the Geminid meteor shower that's happening. Uh, it, it actually peaked tonight, uh, like this morning at 2 a.m., but like most meteor showers, it's extended over a few different days. And so you should still have good views of the meteor shower if you were to go out, you know, maybe not this instant because you're watching this fine program, but um, later tonight, and if you have clear skies, you should be able to see them. So did either of you guys get a chance to look at the, the meteor shower in the last, the last day or two? Well, we tried here, but it's a bit cloudy here in Canada and cold, but hopefully we have a lot of video cameras that caught them, so. Awesome. Yeah, at least we have nice pictures, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, yeah. I'm it, planning to check it out tonight, so. Oh, cool, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'm not trying to pressure you guys or anything. Um, I, yes. Yeah, I, I don't usually go out for meteor showers, uh, but, um, this one coincided with a new moon, so there's not a lot of sky brightness. And so I, I went out to Death Valley the last couple of nights and it was super awesome. And, you know, at peak last night, actually both nights, um, it was supposed to reach like 120 meteors per hour, which is pretty, pretty good, right? Maybe not, I don't know, you're the, you're the expert though again. Okay. Yes, it is. Actually, it's more like 140 meters per hour, which is great. Actually, with the Perseids and maybe just a few other showers, this is the best one you can see. So, yeah, yeah, it was great. There were there were moments where, like, over the course of 15 seconds, I saw you know six in a row, like boo 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 boo, and it's like whoa, it was yeah. And there were some fireballs where where it's really, really bright and, and leaves a little bit of a trail on the sky that lasts a moment. There was one that was very clearly green in color. I'd never seen a color associated with one. It was like, it was awesome, so. Is, is there a name for when they split? I've seen showers when that happens. Oh, wow, I don't know. Yeah, actually, I mean, almost all, every meter split and fragment is just, you you don't see it that for all of them but uh, from what you say actually geminids they're usually uh, are very colored you have like a bit of red mostly green colors so this is a nice shower for that yeah and uh for our audience uh they're called the geminids because they appear to come from the constellation of gemini so if you're if you go out tonight and want to to look for them in the sky you know general viewing you know, uh, don't look at bright things, don't look at your phone and then look up and expect to see these kind of faint things and look in the in the vicinity of, of Gemini, um, which you can use your like, use your phone app to tell you where Gemini is if you aren't able to do it. But, but anyway, um, I don't wanna, I don't know how much you're gonna talk about like viewing things. I you spoil all my talk. Oh no, oh no, I'm sorry. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> okay. Um, Cool. Well, are you guys are you guys having a beverage for astronomy on tap? Since this is cheers, on tap. cheers, uh, cheers, guys. Uh, yeah, or uh, mm. yeah, and cheers, audience members. Drink safely, responsibly. Yeah. Uh, oh, nice. nice. It's so. Uh, it's so hot in Tucson most of the time that there's a very short time of year when I feel like I, I can drink red wine. And so we're now, we're now in red wine season. I have, uh, no, nice. we have beer all of the so rest of the year. So you're not French. <laughs> <laughs> you start to miss it, For right? For us, it's you kind know. of a religion there. <laughs> indeed, indeed. Uh, when, it's, when it's 100 degrees for 60 days in a row, you don't exactly feel like a glass of red wine. <laughs> yeah, I can, I can believe that. I can believe that. Um, okay, cool. Well, I will introduce our first speaker, Orien. Um, Orien, do you wanna do you wanna share your screen as I introduce you? Yes. Okay. So Dr. Oriane Egal is a postdoctoral associate at the University of Western Ontario in Canada. Her work fo focuses on the modeling and prediction of meteor showers. 
like the Geminids happening right now. Through massive simulations on supercomputers, she tries to assess the risk of impact between dust particles and satellites orbiting the Earth or with astronauts enjoying a spacewalk around the International Space Station. She also enjoys traveling around the world to chase clear skies, eclipses, meteorites, and space debris, re-entries. And when the borders are closed, she does skydiving and bungee jumping um, as another great way of spending her time. So are you, it looks like you're ready to go. Um, Andrew and I will, will mute and stop our videos and go ahead and take it away. Okay, so I hope everyone can hear me well. Uh, so as Cameron said, tonight we're gonna talk about mirrors and where to find them. And I just need to start with some definitions in order to clarify what we're talking about. Uh, so we're gonna start with a meteorite. So a meteorite, sorry for the French accent, I'll do my best. Uh, it's a solid natural object that is released into space during the outgassing of comets close to the sun or because of asteroidal collisions. I'm gonna explain that later. Meteorites are usually quite small, uh, with sizes between 30 microns to one meter, but they travel very fast from 11 to 71 meters per second. Kilometers per second, sorry. So actually, when a meteorite enters into a planetary atmosphere, it will essentially burn and emit the light you call a meteor or a shooting star. Meteors usually appear at an altitude of 80 or 110, 120 kilometers, and they typically look like what you can see here in the video. And actually, uh, they are a great way of exchanging matter in the solar system. So when the meteorite is massive enough to survive to the atmospheric reentry, and part of it reaches the ground, the fragment you can find on the ground is called a meteorite. So you have the meteorite on the ground, the meteor in the atmosphere, and the meteorite in space. And the comet or the asteroid that released the meteorite is called the parent body. So when you go outside at night and you look at the sky, actually you can see two kinds of mirrors. Sometimes you will see single mirrors that seem to come from random regions of the sky. Those are called the sporadics. But sometimes, like now, you can see a lot of mirrors in a short amount of time. And then you're probably looking at a meteor shower. Most of the meteor showers are caused by the outcasting of comets close to the sun. So you need to see comets as giant dirty snowballs composed of ices and dust. And each time the comet approaches the sun, the ice starts melting and sublimating, and you will have the ejection of meteorites into space. So you will have this formation of meteorite trails or meteorite streams. And actually, when the Earth crosses one of these trails, you will see a lot of meteors, and you will have a meteor shower. So meteor showers are characterized by the fact whoop, that all the meteors seems to come from the same point in the sky, which is called the radiant. And as Cameron said, the name of the shower it depends on which constellation the radiant is located. For example, here in this picture, you see that all the meteors seems to come from the Draco constellation. So these are the Draconids. And currently you're seeing the Geminids because the radiant is located in the Gemini constellation. So we have the meteor showers, they're characterized by the radiant, but also by the meteor velocity, the, when they occur, basically, and also by their activity. And to characterize the activity of a meteor shower, we generally use a parameter, which is called the zenithal hourly rate, the ZHR, which represents the number of meteor uh, you would observe during one hour under ideal circumstances, like no light pollution, great weather, etc. And so if I'm introducing this parameter, it's just because it allows us to discriminate between a weak, a strong, or a very strong activity. And that's something that's helpful if you want to decide that, I mean, is it worth, worth to go outside and just look at this meteor shower? So to just give you an idea, when we talk about a weak activity, we're usually referring to a few meters per hour. So if you look at the sky during 10 minutes, you might see one, two, maybe three meters but it's still great actually. And when we're talking about a strong activity or an outburst, we're referring to ZHR higher than 100. So during the same, same 10 minutes, this is what you will see. And if you're like super lucky and you have ever seen like a mirror storm, uh, then during 10 minutes, this is what you have observed and I'm super jealous of you. 
So we have actually meteor showers all along the um, all over the year. It's just that these showers doesn't have exactly the same duration or the same strength. So in this figure, I have tried to list and summarize the major annual meteor showers, the one you're supposed to see every year, but sometimes even minor showers that are barely perceptible most of the time can just display a huge activity and you can have some occasional outbursts. So you can have uh, very nice surprises in meteor science. In this list, actually there's two showers that are really interesting if you're in really nice if you're interested in visual observations. The first one, it's Perseids. They occur in late July or August, and they're super famous. You have a lot of astro, astro camps that are dedicated to these observations. But actually, one of the most active meteor shower you can see every year is occurring right now. So they're Geminids. Uh, and at the maximum, actually, um, the, the ZHR of the Geminids is like 140 meters per hour, more or less. So as Cameron said again, uh, the peak of activity of the Geminids was early this morning. But if you observe tonight, and you should observe tonight, you will still see uh, plenty of Geminids meters. And in 10 minutes again, this is more or less what you could observe. So it's, it's still a great show. If you're interested in near showers, how to observe them, when to observe them, I strongly encourage you to go to the International Media Organization website, imo.net, because there you will really find all the information you need for the meteor observations. You have uh, meteor showers calendars, you have uh, the meteor activity of the week, information about the last fireballs that have been seen. So fireballs are very bright meteors, and sometimes some of them can drop meteorites. So they're very interesting events. So literally, if you're interested in anything related to the meteors, go there and you will find the answers to your questions. So how do we observe meteors? Luckily, we have very different ways of detecting them. I talk about visual observations because this is obvious, but actually meteor science is maybe the last field in astronomy for which visual observations matter. When we do modeling of meteor showers, we need to keep track of the shower's activity over long periods of time. And we just can't put cameras everywhere and forever. So we still need people to just go outside, look at the sky and count how many meters they see. So if you want to help us, you can report that to us. So you can do that in a very professional way, like this guy uh, being prepared with your pencil, your coffee and stay there during all the night. But you can also adopt a more like relaxing approach. You can just take outside your lounge chair, look at the sky for 20 minutes or half an hour and just report how many meteors you've seen. So we have the visual observations. We can also detect the meteors in the radio range because the radio waves are reflected by the meteors. So we can detect them in this way. And we also have a whole bunch of video cameras dedicated to meteor observations with very different characteristics. Actually, year after year, uh, we have more and more detection networks dedicated to meteor observations. And we're reaching an unprecedented accuracy uh, on our observations, in our observations, sorry. Um, for example, here at Western, we have a great instrument, which is called CAMOM, that allows to see the fragmentation of even tiny meteors in the atmosphere. And this is what you can see in this animation. So even the very small meteorites in the atmosphere, so you don't, with naked eye, you have no impression of fragmentation or anything. You just see the meters going there. When you look at it uh, with a very good accuracy, high resolution optical devices, this is what you see. So most of the meters actually are fragmenting. So why we're doing that and why we try to observe meters with very different techniques to learn as much as we can about them. Well, first, because mirror showers are beautiful and I personally really enjoy going outside and just look at them. Uh, so you guys in LA might won't be as concerned as I am with time accuracy because you have nights and warm nights there. Uh, but since I arrived in Canada and I discovered the winter in Canada, believe me when I say that in December, I want to know exactly when I'm supposed to go outside to see a meteor. I don't want to spend whole night just waiting for the maximum peak of activity. So to do that, we need to have very good predictions of meteor showers. If we're looking at meteors, it's just because when you see the meteor, so the meteorite, that's the same thing, 
you're looking at a piece of comet or asteroid. And comets and asteroids are the most primitive bodies in our solar system. So we can gain a lot of information about these bodies and about the solar system formation and evolution. For example, when we analyze meteorites, we can have some clues about the solar system age, the composition, about the apparition of water or even life on Earth. And on the other side, when we just uh, record a mirror and find the parent body, then we, we learn a lot about the past history of this parent body. Where was the comet in the past? Was it active? How it evolved between the time of the mirror dejection and the current epoch? And actually establishing this link between the mirror and its parent body is essential if we want to predict meteor showers because we can't make any accurate prediction of a meteor shower if we don't know the parent body. So we're interested in that obviously for many scientific reasons, but also because mirrors represent a threat uh, to the safety of satellites and main missions. Because as I say, even if mirrors are very small, they travel very fast. So they carry a lot of energy that can be dangerous for satellites or astronauts, for example. To give you an idea, a millimeter size meteorite in space is as dangerous as a bus going at 60 miles per hour. I like to show this example just to prove that. Um, this is a lab experiment that is mimicking the impact of a Navy between a Navy transit satellite and the equivalent of a meteorite of size one centimeter that goes at 70 kilometers per second. So this is the nice satellite before, and this is the state of the room after. So you really see that here we're talking about mission critical damages. So we know that there have been impacts between meteorites and spacecraft in the past. We've seen that in the Sentinel-1 uh, spacecraft, Mariner 4, and Gaia, even in the International Space Station. Luckily, these impacts didn't destroy the spacecraft, but sometimes we can have some dramatic consequences. For example, in 1993, uh, the European Space Agency satellite Olympus-1 was lost because uh, it was striked by a perceived meteorite. So actually the agency lost a satellite of $850 million. So they weren't super happy about that. The problem is that we have lots of spacecraft out there. So we really need to map where these meteorite streams are in the inner solar system to kind of avoid the most dangerous regions for the spacecraft. We also have a lot of spacecraft or communication satellites orbiting Earth. And most importantly, we have some astronauts in the International Space Station. And lab experiments show again that some meteorites are able to perforate the shielding of the International Space Station or the ATV main module. So even if the perforation probability of the International Space Station over a course of 20 years of mission is very low, it was estimated to be about 1%, during a few hours when you have a meteor shower, this probability can increase by a factor of 10,000. So that's pretty why we need to observe, identify meteor showers and predict their future accuracy, just to know how many meteors are going to be around Earth in function of time. So part of my job is to do that, trying to improve uh, the meteor showers forecast and especially the intensity prediction of the meteor showers. But I'm not going to give you all the details here in a 15 minute talks. So I'm just going to talk about the general idea behind what we do. So as I said, uh, you can't predict a meteor shower if you don't know the parent body. So the first step is to observe meteors. So usually we observe meteors with a bunch of optical cameras. And when you see a meteor by triangulation, you're able to determine uh, its trajectory in the atmosphere and to build what was its past motion in the solar system before impacting Earth. And by doing so, if you have several meteors or very high quality data, you can have a chance to find the parent body. Once we identify the parent body, so for example, in this case, a comet, you can try to make a prediction using numerical simulations. So what you do is that you build a virtual solar system in your computer. You put the sun, you put the planets, you put the forces you need there, and then you add your parent body. And then you start ejecting particles, which represent simulated meteorites, and you see if these meteorites cause any meteor activity on Earth. And really the core of the approach is to calibrate and validate our simulations on decades of meteor observations. So to do that, we're gonna use the visual observations from you guys, if you help us, or video observations, radio observations, 
And the idea is really to twist our model parameters to be able to reproduce what we have observed on Earth in the past. And once we're able to reproduce, for example, the past activity of the Geminids over 50 years, then we can have some confidence in our predictions for the future activity of the shower. But this is not super easy, especially in some cases. And to convince you of that, I would like to share with you a very nice animation that was done by Rachel Soja. So in this animation, you see the solar system. You have Earth's orbit right here, Mars, and here you have Jupiter's orbit. And you have these very famous comets, 67P, Shryumov, Gerasimenko, the one that was visited by the Rosetta spacecraft. And each time you'll see the comet approaches the sun, you see the formation of a new dust trail, so a new mirrored stream that is kind of like nicely and smoothly following the comet trajectory, the comet orbit. This is kind of an easy case for now. Everything goes fine. Meteorites stay more or less close to the comet orbit. The problem is that these trails will be perturbated by the action of radiative forces or other planets, and in this case, specifically by Jupiter, because Jupiter is a giant planet uh, that likes to destroy a bit the structure of the meteorite streams. So here you see a close encounter between Jupiter and the Miri trail. You have the Rosetta spacecraft that is reaching the comet. And you see actually how the dust trail uh, is drastically modified by the interaction with Jupiter. And the situation can only go worse because here you will see another close encounter between Jupiter and some of these mirrors. And you see how the structure gets complicated. You have filaments, you have gaps, and this is what you obtain 50 years later. So 50 years is almost nothing. And you see how different the stream structure is from the beginning. So actually, when we have this case, it's kind of hard to really accurately predict what is going to happen at Earth. But we're doing a lot of progresses because we have each time more and more meteor observations and more computing power. So we're becoming very good at it. And now for all the annual showers we see, for which we have a lot of meteor observations, we're really able to anticipate and forecast the shower's activity over 50 years, sometimes 100 years. So this is where I leave you. Uh, if you're not convinced that you should go outside tonight and look at the Geminids, I'm just showing here uh, what our cameras recorded during two hours only last night, so close to the Geminids peak. And yes, that's it for me. So thank you very much for your attention. And I will be happy to answer any question you may have. Awesome. That was super cool. I really like this video too. Wow. Yeah. Look at this. <laughs> this is a oh, stacked cute. image <laughs> of the mirrors we recorded last night. That's incredible. That's <laughs> incredible. Um, yeah, uh, that, that's amazing uh, to see. So that was just like an hour long uh, time lapse that we were watching or? The first one. Yeah, I think it's two hours. Uh, okay. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Wow. Cool. Um, we have a ton of great questions and I have, I have questions too, but okay. I'm going to ask their questions first and then I'll throw in some. <laughs> so um, let's see. Is it true that if you find a meteorite that has just fallen, you should not pick it up as it will be very cold or potentially very hot? Yeah. So it's not going to be very hot uh, okay. because even if the Mirid is burning in the atmosphere at some point. I mean, the velocity is decreasing because you have the air density that is increasing too. And you have a phase which is called the dark flight where because it stops heating and emitting light, you don't see the mirid anymore, but the rock or the iron is still there. And actually it's gonna fall down more slowly and be very perturbated by the winds, almost like a leaf, <laughs> you see? And so this phase can last many seconds, even minutes. So actually when it arrives on Earth, I'm talking about small meteorites, <laughs> the ones that are not going to create like a big crater. I'm not talking about asteroids, but the small ones, when they arrive, they're not gonna, going to be warm. So you can take them after in terms of legal rights of taking them and keeping them. It depends on the country you are. I see, I see. So one could, it, it wouldn't be freeze. it wouldn't be freezing, or it wouldn't be like scorching hot, as you say, and it no. wouldn't be freezing cold. It should just be kind of like a middling temperature where you could actually pick it up and not. 
yeah mm-hmm. because it's spending like uh, quite a lot of time actually in the atmosphere is just coming down slowly i mean after this very let's say warm and initial phase so no you should be able to take it oh okay okay cool um let's see uh are there any recorded deaths from a meteor striking a person and like landing on them no, uh, so I don't have exactly the data, but a woman get hurt in United States, I think, I don't remember if it was like in the 40s or 50s, because a meteorite uh, landed, uh, landed, I don't know, impacted her house, she was sleeping on the couch, just taking a nap, and the meteorite just like destroyed her roof, like burnt into, I don't remember which kind of furniture and landed in her belly and so she had like very black uh i don't know you say you know like some minor issues but there haven't there hasn't been any deaths reported um because of a meteorite impact you have some injuries for example in chile in 2013 um you had uh, some shock waves because of the fragmentation of the meteorite and then all the glasses were like uh, broken and a lot of people got injured because of that. But usually when you see like somebody died because a meteorite, I mean, he took a meteorite on the head or anything, it's just a scam. I mean, until now, yeah. (laughs) Okay, interesting. But presumably at some point in history, like a massive thing like the Tunguska uh, explosion or something like that potentially could have. uh, Yes, yes, actually. we're not looking at this moment. There's, there has been a recent study about Tungunska saying that maybe some Russian uh, persons were killed there. Uh, I haven't read the last research paper. It's okay. really hard to, to be sure of that. It's just witnesses because it was in Siberia and nobody was right. there. And then you have the Russian government and some like, uh, let's say, international <laughs> competition. But yeah, that might be one of the cases where somebody dies just hasn't been reported right away it's kind of mysterious sure sure yeah i mean it was a long time ago and it was yeah i mean if you have a big object you can have damages in the scale of a city so i'm not talking about the big asteroids that for example killed in part the dinosaurs of everything but even objects of a few tens of meters can be dangerous it's just that also luckily most of our planet is composed by oceans so you have a lot of of that land there so that's a good point but yeah it, it can happen i see okay give us money <laughs> just kidding <laughs> um let's see uh can we estimate the particle size distribution of meteoroids uh limer- liberated by a new cometary pass before encountering the stream directly so like the comet goes by and it yanks off a bunch of particles. Do we know anything about the distribution of those sizes of particles before we actually have that that shower? Uh, yeah, actually, we we know that very well with space missions, in situ space missions like the Rosetta spacecraft that is able to measure the size exactly of the meteorites close to the nucleus. Mm-hmm. Um, if the the meteorites that are released uh, impact Earth right away or in a short period of time, we might just by with meteor observations have a nice idea of the size distribution, but usually that's not the case because bigger and smaller particles won't evolve exactly in the same way in the solar system because you have radiative forces and things like that that can be perturbated. So we are able to measure size distribution or mass distribution on Earth, but it doesn't have to be exactly the same one at the ejection at the comet. So if you're looking at a very young material, you're gonna approach that. And then actually this is something really I'm working on is now with we have so many meteor observations and the modeling are becoming very good. So for example, in my modeling of the showers activity, I have this parameter at the comet, which is something I need to solve, was the size distribution of the particles at the comet. And if you have enough observation for the first time, we start constraining these parameters just with near observations. Oh, okay. Interesting. It's like a tough question. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, but 
yeah, this is maybe the one of the most recent advances we have in terms of modeling is that the accuracy of the data and a lot of computing power allow us for the first time, yes, to really know much more about the comet than what we were doing before. We already had a lot of information there, and this is much cheaper than any space mission you can send there. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So what are, so I think you said this, but the, when we see the meteors during a meteor shower or when you're looking out in the night sky, what are the size of those particles that are actually causing the, the meteors that we see? Like, are they rocks? Are they pebbles? Are they? Uh, probably a mix of it. So most of the meteor showers come from comets. So it's more like fluffy material and mm. like very big fireballs that will drop a meteorite, you need to have very strong material that's not going to like uh, Burn disaggregate in the atmosphere. So this is like more asteroidal, uh, mm. but usually uh, with naked eyes, you're looking at millimeter size particles and more. I mean, if it's bigger than that, you're gonna see it. Uh, and with optical devices, you can go a bit beyond than that. And with radio observations, you can, yeah, reach meters of, I don't know, 10 power minus eight grams or something like that. So, wow. So, millimeter size. So, like the size of like a sand grain ish would cause yes. something that you could see as a meteor in the sky. Yes, or more. I mean, fireballs are going to be more centimeter sizes and 10 centimeters. And wow. Yeah. It's tiny, but I say tiny doesn't mean it doesn't right. count, right? <laughs> right. That's amazing. Okay. Um, just a couple more questions, and then we'll move on. Uh, can I can I ask a question? Yeah, by all means, go ahead. Uh, Andy. Yeah, I don't know. It's a lot here. Um, is there a size range that burns up entirely and doesn't reach the ground? Oh yeah, when I'm talking about a millimeter size, even sometimes centimeter size, I mean, they're not reaching the ground. Yeah. They're absolutely not a threat. When we find meteorites, it's usually, yeah, tens of centimeters or even more sometimes. I mean, for Chelyabinsk, you have maybe 20 meters. The, the first one was maybe 20 meters, so. Okay, so but it has to be bigger than about 10 centimeters. Yeah. Yeah. Because cool. you have like a lot of ablation and then fragmentation. So you have these, even I show you, even for the very small mirrors, you have a lot of fragmentation. So as you decrease in size, it becomes harder and harder to survive until reaching the ground. So yes, you need to be quite dense and quite big. <laughs> uh, there's one question from an audience member about so remember uh, a couple of years ago, it was big in the news, the idea that we would, we would pull over an asteroid, you know, we'd tow over, like gravitationally tow over an asteroid and mine it for the various metals, rare metals and precious metals that might be present in it. But I think that ended up go, essentially going, I, I wanna say it was planetary industries. Do you guys remember? I don't know. They're still thinking about that. Oh, they are, okay. Yeah. Asteroids mining is a natural question. Okay. Especially in terms of low, you have a lot of discussion. And then obviously it concerns the mirror community because you're creating mirror showers this way too. Sure. Yeah. Well, it seems, I don't know, it seems problematic in a variety of ways to be moving around the objects in our solar system to benefit us. But, but regardless of the ethical decisions here, um, somebody suggested uh, has anyone talked about rather than trying to mine it like in situ in its actual location, trying to pull it on so it slams into the earth and then it blows up and then you go and grab all the parts, which also seems very problematic <laughs> from an ethical perspective? Uh, I don't know. I would personally be scared <laughs> if yeah. somebody was really thinking about that. Uh, I hope not. I'm sure somebody thought about that. But yeah, I, I mean, then not. I don't see like, I don't see it way more easy um, than going there, which is already very hard. But yeah, I, I don't know. I hope not. <laughs> um, and lastly, are is there um, is there any concern that the contents of meteorites or their parent bodies might be radioactive in some capacity and could cause, you know, again, the question of like, if you find, you know, you see this thing that fell to the ground and you're like, oh, maybe I should go pick it up. 
obviously there are the legal and, and scientific concerns about it, but also is there concern that it might be radioactive in some capacity? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, not at all. You have some uh, radioactive components there, but that are not like dangerous for us, like uh, some isotopes that we were using, for example, to date the, yeah, just date the age of a meteorite, like what you're doing on Earth, it's the same radioactivity we are, we're having here. So no, actually, I mean, what we're finding here, it's very similar to the solar system com I mean, composition. We're not talking about us being in space without the shield of the atmosphere and like UV light or, you know, these like uh, very charged particles that can be dangerous for us. Now, when the meteorite comes here, uh, it might be have some radioactive components, but nothing that can represent a threat for us. Okay. Okay. Cool. Cool. You have radioactivity a bit everywhere, right? Even here right. on Earth. The questions sure. are which one and the quantity. Awesome. Well, Excellent talk. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, thank you for the invitation. <laughs> yeah, no, this was great. And, and very topical considering, you know, the Geminids are happening right now. So, yeah. So what recommendations do we have for viewers? They should go outside, uh, let their eyes adjust to the darkness, try to be in a, as dark a, a, a place as possible. Um, yeah. Try and look in the direction of Gemini. And the whole reason why it peaked this morning at 2 a.m. is because Gemini was at its highest point in the sky at that time. Um, and so you're more likely to see these things that are coming, seem to be coming off of Gemini, but you can still see it earlier. Like I had very good viewing at 9 p.m., 10 p.m., 11 p.m., so. Yeah, sure. Don't, maybe don't, just don't look right at the di right direction of the radiant because I mean, all the meteors are going in every di direction from there. So it's not maybe the greatest place to look at, but you know, like 20 degrees off just or, if you're looking close to the horizons, you will have these sun, grazers, fireballs, which are also, earth grazers, sorry, fireballs, that can be nice. But yes, don't look right at the radiant, but try to keep it in your field of view. Why, so fireballs are just larger bodies than the, the sand grainish size things. Yes. But I read somewhere, and forgive me for not knowing the answer, um, that you were more likely to see uh, fireballs, both associated with Geminid than some of the other meteor showers, but also like earlier in the evening, you were more likely to see them than later. Or maybe that was just, maybe I read a bunch of BS. I don't know. Um, Does that make sense? I couldn't figure out a dynamic reason why you'd be more likely to see it at an earlier hour. But For the Geminids, I, I don't know. Yeah, no, I don't, I don't think so. Maybe I'm wrong, but I, I don't see why neither. Yeah, I, I should ask. yeah, you have like a lot of fireballs that are associated with the Geminids. But I mean, yeah, from my personal observations, I tend to see them in the middle of the night, but that might be a bias too. <laughs> what were you going to say, Andrew? Yeah, no, so I was just going to ask, Orian, you're, you're saying to, that it can be good to look closer to the horizon. Uh, is that just because you're seeing through more of the Earth's atmosphere? It's just that you're going to see the longer, the longest ones, right. you know, just because they're sure. yeah. breathing. And so, but you have less of them. So I wouldn't especially recommend that, but yes, just <laughs> don't try to look right to the, in the direction of the radiance. Cool. Well, thank you very much. That was excellent. Thank you. <laughs> um, cool. All right. So Andrew, do you think, uh, do you think you're ready to go as well? Um, yeah, sure. I can. Uh, yeah, you want me to start the screen sharing? Yeah, and I will. I will introduce you. Yeah, ready. All right. So, Dr. Andrew Uden is an associate professor of astronomy at the University of Arizona. He is a theoretical astrophysicist who mainly works on the formation of planetary systems. His research interests include cold minor planets in the Kuiper Belt and hot Jupiters orbiting other stars. During the pandemic, Andrew has been chasing after his one going on two year old uh, and using both a nearby swimming pool and YouTube videos, not at the same time for safety's sake, to try to learn flip turns for the backstroke, which is pretty awesome. So I knew Andrew, uh, I met Andrew, I was at University of Arizona as a postdoc prior to moving to Caltech and we overlapped there. And Andrew is a super awesome dude uh, who, who does some really cool science. 
and is, uh, yeah, is super cool. So I'm really happy to welcome him to our program. And yeah, it looks, it looks good. So Orianne and I can, uh, can mute and stop our videos and let you take it away. Um, unfortunately, I can't take it away quite yet. The slides oh. are not advancing and- Oh, okay. Uh, do, you need to, do you need to do anything special to, to make it work that I can? Um, yeah, I just, I will try that again. I think yeah. I'm gonna, uh, all right. That looks good. Are we there? Yeah, it looks good. Okay, um, great. All right. Uh, so yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks everyone for for joining us uh, this evening. Um, um, I'm not going to be quite as timely as what is going on tonight and last night, but I'm going to try and talk about something that uh, maybe you've seen um, uh, in the news, and that's uh, this sort of uh, hopefully famous image of. Uh, um, of a Kuiper Belt object that was recently flown by, which is a remarkable uh, recent thing that happened. Um, and as Cameron said, I'm a, I'm a theorist, so I'm interested in uh, what these objects can tell us in general about how planets form. And so that's sort of what I have on the right side of this plot here uh, is, is sort of some different perspectives on some computer simulations uh, that uh, my collaborators and I um, uh, have used to try to understand uh, planet formation. Um, and so I'll, I'll just give you a little introduction to what are the kinds of things we do in these, in these simulations. Uh, we're interested in forming these sort of relatively small objects. Um, and we're doing this not in the current solar system that we live in today and we just heard about, but we're doing it very early uh, in the history of solar, the solar system or indeed around other young stars. Um, where there is a bunch of gas and dust orbiting the young star, right? And that's sort of what, uh, uh, what, what you're seeing uh, um, there, that sort of brown object to the right of the star. Um, now, because we're trying to study very small things, we don't model that whole disk of gas and dust, but we model a small patch of it. And so that's what you're seeing just above there is this small patch where we're studying how all the gas moves around uh, in this sort of one local region uh, but there's not just gas, there's all the solid material, the dust, the rocks that we want to make the solid planets out of. Uh, and so that's what you're seeing sort of in the green down to the lower side. It's all these solids that have settled down uh, because they're pulled down by the, uh, uh, by the gravity of the star towards the middle uh, of the disk. Um, and as you see, and this is going to be part of the point of the talk, they're not evenly spread in that middle layer but they're clumping up into these filaments. And it's the, it's the clumping up into these filaments uh, and then even into the even denser knots that you see in the further zoom in within these filaments uh, that's part of how we think uh, planets uh, and especially these early small planets uh, form. And so what I'm gonna, my goal for this talk is to try to explain to you how uh, sort of observations uh, like this of the Kuiper belt uh, can help us prove, uh, or at least give some evidence uh, that these sort of theoretical ideas that we work on might actually be correct. Okay, um, so, so let's start with maybe reminding or telling people what the New Horizons mission was, right? So the New Horizons was this small satellite that was launched from uh, Earth at a, at a very high speed. Uh, it did a a uh, slingshot past Jupiter, uh, and then it had this amazing trick shot where it first visited Pluto uh, and then uh, flew by uh, a second uh, Kuiper Belt object, uh, MU69, which later became known uh, as Arakoth. Uh, and it will just uh, continue on its, uh, on its way out of the, out of the solar system. Um, so obviously it's, uh, it's pretty cool that it was able to hit these two moving targets uh, as well as it did. In fact, Arakoth was not even discovered at the time New Horizons was launched. They had to find something that was going to be uh, along this path. It took a lot of effort, but they, they were able to do it and, and thank goodness they were. Um, 
So, okay, so the, the uh, you know, the main goal of the New Horizons mission was to visit uh, Pluto and Charon. There's lots of amazing things that were found there. Uh, but for this short talk, the thing I want to emphasize, and indeed this was already known, uh, is that Pluto and Charon, um, Pluto and its largest moon, Charon, if you didn't know, uh, Pluto had a, a large moon, uh, they're, they're actually more like a binary system. Right, and so I say that because you see with the numbers on the um, uh, on the lower right, uh, Charon is about twelve percent the mass of Pluto. Right, so it's not the same, but you know it's it's in the uh, it's in the ballpark. Um, this is for comparison with our Moon, which is only about one percent of the mass of the Earth. Right, so so it's a pretty big Moon, big enough to call it a binary. Um, but then Pluto and Charon they actually have a bunch of actually really tiny moons where even the biggest of them is only three millionths of the mass of Pluto. Um, and so for comparison, the, Earth's is about, the Earth is about three millionths the mass of the sun. Um, and so from that perspective, this sort of amazing system you have um, is, is really like a circumbinary uh, planetary system, right? Where the two stars are Pluto and Charon, um, and then the planets uh, are these tiny moons. Um, and so indeed, uh, circumbinary planets are something that uh, were thought of long ago in science fiction, um, and now they have been discovered by astronomers uh, around real binary stars. Um, and so I decided instead of showing a clip from Star Wars to show this uh, Etsy poster instead. I, I didn't want uh, George Lucas uh, coming after me. They can, they can go after this Etsy uh, shop owner instead. Um, so the next stop for uh, New Horizons uh, was uh, this, this second Kuiper Belt object, uh, Arakoth. Uh, and I sort of already showed you what it really looked like in the title slide. And so obviously, you know, people were sort of you know, uh, sort of amazed that it had this interesting uh, bilobed shape and of course came up with all these other uh, fun things, including another Star Wars themed thing, uh, themed thing um, uh, that it looks like. My favorite was the astronomy picture of the day going with a uh, misshapen uh, potato on uh, April Fool's Day uh, this year. Um, but of course, the uh, so for, for returning to the real object now, um, what again, for the purposes of this talk, uh, is interesting to note is that we again have a binary, right? The idea, this is what's known as a contact binary. And so the idea is that the, this, these were once two separate lobes, uh, which uh, merged and uh, joined uh, at the neck. And that's, that's why they look this way. It's, Contact binaries are right. There are other uh, known contact binaries in the solar system, but this is really one of the one of the more remarkable examples. Um, I think we even saw some of the comets that look like they uh, um, they they have that structure. Um, so it so to people who are not experts in the Kuiper belt, it might have been, hey, wow, uh, something that's a binary in the Kuiper belt isn't that crazy? Obviously, Pluto and Charon are in the Kuiper belt, but they're bigger, sort of. But it turns out that binaries are, are actually the norm, right? And so if you actually look at the Kuiper belt with uh, uh, even from Earth or near Earth with the best instruments possible, for instance, with the Hubble Space Telescope, right? And you uh, look at Kuiper belt objects, you very often find that they are, when you look at them closely enough, that uh, there's two of them, that they're in a, in a binary pair. Um, um, I, uh, I'll, I'll note that on the, for the bottom image, the uh, smudge that's just below the uh, brighter Kuiper Belt object uh, is, is actually a background galaxy. So I know often people who study different distant uh, galaxies complain that solar system objects are the, the vermin that pollute their observations. So here, here we have a galaxy that's uh, polluting solar system uh, observations. Um, and so, so the remarkable fact is that when you look at, and I don't want to get too much into jargon and subpopulations of this Kuiper belt of objects that's beyond Neptune, um, but there are different populations. And the one that I'm going to focus is on is what's called the cold classical Kuiper belt. 
Um, and all that really means is that uh, it's the one that has interacted least with Neptune. So for my purposes of trying to understand planet formation, it's the best one for me to look at. And indeed, when you look at that population, it's the one that has all the binaries in it, right? So 30% of them are observed to be binaries, but you can only see the ones that are pretty far away. So it's, it's quite plausible that all or you know essentially all of them most of them are uh, uh, are in binaries um, and so again the question I want to ask is what does the fact that there are all these binaries you know what does that tell us about how planetesimals form in general and as we already heard in the last talk that's something we really want to understand right we also get clues from asteroids and comets and of course we need these planetesimals also to be the building blocks of all other larger planets, including, uh, of course, Earth itself. So it's a very important problem in, in all of astrophysics and planetary science. Um, so, okay. So we now have then, we're gonna try and address these two uh, important and related questions. How do planetesimals form in general? And then how do these binaries form? So in the simplest terms, there, there are two ways to, to make a, a bigger thing from smaller things. You can have a bottom-up approach where you gradually piece by piece, uh, put the small things together. That's a process of collisions and sticking. Uh, or you can have a top-down approach where you have things that are in some region and because of gravitational attraction, uh, they get closer and closer together and then just collapse on themselves and eventually form uh, a, a more massive object. Uh, and so we have uh, examples of, of, of both of these happening. Um, and so in terms of, you know, and, and, it, and it's actually quite likely that both of these processes happen. And indeed it's currently thought that small dust grains collide and stick together, but at some point, millimeter centimeter sizes, collisions can become destructive in the early solar system. And so that's when uh, it's a, a top-down type process of collapse uh, is, is thought to occur. Um, but how can we show that, that that actually happens? So let's now ask the question of how these binary Kuiper belt objects might form. Well, they could form through some sort of giant impact. That's like how we think the moon forms. Something comes in, crashes in, there's some debris and it reassembles in, into two objects. Um, there's even without a collision, you can have two objects that pass near each other, uh, but then they just give up some of their energy and extra motion to all the other bodies around them just through gravitational forces. And then they wind up orbiting each other uh, uh, at the end. Um, and then there's the uh, idea that I'm going to explain why, why I think there's a lot of support for. Um, is that as part of this gravitational collapse top-down picture, if you form an object that is rotating too quickly, you can't put all of that, what we call angular momentum, all of that spinning motion into a single object. And so you have to put it into at least a pair of objects uh, like a binary, right? So obviously if we can, uh, you know, show good evidence for the fact that binary Kuiper belt objects form in this top-down way. That gives us some good evidence that all planetesimals might form uh, in this top-down gravitational collapse way. So go, going to the, the theory side just a little bit, I won't go very far, you know, how, why do we think that planetesimals might form by gravitational collapse? There's, there's a Big problem here is that even this disk surrounding the young star is very low density. Everything is very far apart, so gravity is kind of weak. So getting things to collapse on themselves is, is hard. Uh, so the solution is to find some way to get those solids, to get those pebbles and rocks to come closer together uh, um, so that gravity can become stronger and to somehow invoke gas dynamics to do that. So this is something that happens on Earth. We see it if the wind blows in the in the right way. Uh, you're on a country road, uh, or it happens in cities too. Uh, that you get uh, leaves collecting in these whirlwinds, vortices, uh, leaf devils. You can find lots of uh, uh, nice examples of this. In terms of concentrating dust in planet-forming disks, 
That's actually something we see all the time now, thanks to powerful uh, radio telescopes. These are images of, uh, of young planet forming disks around other stars where you see that they're not smooth, but there's structure that, that you're seeing mainly the dust here and it's concentrated uh, often into rings, sometimes into spirals or even into, uh, uh, as you see on the bottom right, a sort of, uh, uh, um, uh, sort of extended vortex-like structure. Um, this sounds like exactly what we want. There is a little bit of a difficulty in that one of the main theories for how these structures form is that you already have planets. So then you can't then say, oh, well, how do you make the first planet uh, if these structures are formed by planets? That's a classic chicken and egg problem. And so one solution to that, uh, this general problem of forming planetesimals and that chicken and egg problem uh, is to find a more general way to concentrate solids in disks. And that's something that I've worked on that's called the streaming instability. And so the streaming is the fact that this dust in the disk uh, sort of, uh, it, it naturally drifts inward. And as it drifts inward, it's subject to something that makes it start clumping, right? And so uh, what you're seeing here is those simulations I talked about at the very beginning. Um, and Cameron, how am I doing on time? I know I tend to go on. Anyway. Um, all right, well, I'll, I'll keep going for a little bit until he tells me to stop. <laughs> uh, what, what you're seeing here is an overhead view of that patch of the disk. And the lighter colors are where the dust density is higher. These are denser filaments uh, of dust that have, have started to form by the streaming instability. So I'm gonna let the movie go and these filaments are, are dense enough that uh, self-gravity uh, causes them to fragment into, uh, as you see, a large number uh, of gravitationally bound clumps, uh, which, um, uh, which, which will go on to, to become planetesimals. Okay, so that's the theoretical idea we're, we're basically working with in a nutshell. Um, now, what's the evidence that binary Kuiper belt objects sort of form by this type of collapse? Well, one is that when you look at these Kuiper belt objects, uh, th these aren't real colors, but they're, they're sort of a representation of what's done. They're, they're not all the same color, but if you look at the two objects uh, that are in a given binary system, their colors match. And so what does that mean? No one's going around painting these objects, right? They have the colors they do because of the composition of things that are in them. And as things form in slightly different regions or slightly different times, right? They will just naturally have, uh, have different colors. Um, and so what this is saying is this doesn't like, look like two objects that came randomly together. Uh, they, they really formed together uh, as you would naturally expect from a uh, gravitational collapse and not, uh, uh, not, not from a capture type process. And uh, credit to David uh, Nesvorny for this uh, orrery image of uh, the, the orbits of these, uh, um, of these relatively equal mass binaries orbiting their uh, uh, berry centers or the crosses. Um, so, and then recently there was remarkably an even more specific piece of evidence to tie these binaries to not just this gravitational collapse picture, but specifically to this streaming instability picture. So these simulations uh, that were done by Urshan Lee at the University of Arizona, um, right, in these simulations, when these, uh, these gravitationally bound clumps you're seeing in the upper right formed, he can measure the direction they're spinning in and then make a prediction for what's the orientation of the binary that should form as a, as a result. And as you see, there's sort of generally two options sort of pictured below. There's if they're going around uh, in their orbit kind of in the same way uh, that, the, um, that they're going around their orbit, that's called prograde. Uh, and if they're going kind of in the backward sense, that's retrograde. Um, so it turns out that most of them, about 80%, uh, as you see in the plot, go in the prograde direction. Uh, that's, uh, that's observations of the actual Kuiper Belt objects are shown in that dashed line. And what's measured in the simulations is a very close match to what you see with the observations. So this, and remarkably, this is different 
from what you expect if they were captured. They should actually be the other way. So this is a really decisive test uh, of, of, uh, of showing that collapse is likely uh, how this occurs. Uh, and then the last piece of evidence I want to show you comes from actually the New Horizons mission and the New Horizons team themselves. This is an area of detailed geophysics. It's actually not my specialty. Uh, but what they did is they tried to recreate the right detailed right structure of this contact binary, including this somewhat delicate neck. And they found when they modeled the collisions of these rubble piles, that that neck area is obviously subject to a lot of stress. And so they found that as a result of, you know, those strong stresses, the collision had to be quite gentle. And so that gentle collision is something that is, con again, consistent with this, everything starts close to, to each other to begin with and is just collapsing on itself a little bit versus a violent, more violent uh, collision of something coming from far apart. Um, so uh, I'll sort of wrap it up there and say again, we've now got multiple lines of evidence for gravitational collapse of these Kuiper Belt binaries. And that supports the general idea that that's how these planetesimals form uh, by this gravitational collapse, uh, possibly seeded by the streaming instability. And I wanna give a big shout out to Ursh, uh, Dr. Urshan Lee, who was uh, uh, until recently a graduate student at the University of Arizona and who's responsible for a lot of these uh, uh, great simulations uh, I've, I've shown you. So uh, thanks a lot. And I'll take any questions if there's time. Great, that was awesome. Thank you, Andrew. And this is this photograph is your uh, is your one to two year old one going on two year old. Uh, yes, correct, correct. This is a couple uh, yeah a couple evenings ago one of our, our sunset dog walks. So that is a great picture. That is a great picture. Uh, yeah. Um, lots of good questions uh, that we have here. I'm gonna go back to our our viewing mode. Okay, so. Um, Okay, let's see. What are some ways scientists find other bodies? Bennu was found, I imagine things further away will be harder. Um, I think the mission was extended. So what else do you think New Horizons will be able to find over its whole lifetime and trajectory? Um. Yeah, yeah. So obviously, you know, in terms of, you know, how they found it, it was with sort of very deep, you know, the Arakoth was found sort of very deep searches uh, with, with the Hubble Space Telescope. Um, you don't necessarily need Hubble to find Kuiper Belt objects, right? But it was, right, this was, you know, it had to be a very specific search in a very specific region. So there's a lot that's done with ground-based telescopes. Um, and, and then also, um, yeah, and then Hubble is great for, especially for characterizing the binaries. Um, although even some of the binaries can be, can be resolved from the ground. Um, what was the, oh, and, and in terms of whether New Horizons, you know, it's only getting into the deeper and deeper reaches of space where, you know, the densities of objects are just getting much, much lower. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I think there was some talk of it might be possible to find something else on the way out, but I, I would not count on that at, at this point. They, um, you know, I think they, there are some things like these dust counters. I don't know if they can, you know, right, as Voyager and other missions, as they leave the solar system, they can take measurements of magnetic fields and some things like that. So I, I'd have to look into what all the instruments they have and what they can say on the way out, but I, I wouldn't expect them to visit another object. I see. Okay. Um, so you mentioned the Pluto being essentially like a binary system with its primary moon, Charon. Um, and then again, Arakoth, the Mu69, this object that you were describing as being a, a binary and saying that it was reasonably frequent to find these kind of binary objects in the Kuiper belt, you know, the, the outer parts of the solar system. But in the asteroid belt, which is obviously much closer in inside of Jupiter, do you also find a high proportion of binaries there? Um, so yeah, so this is, um, so the simple answer, yes, there are binaries in the asteroid belt. Um, this is, uh, it's not quite as useful in the same way. 
Um, and the reason, again, just really goes back to this pristine nature, the, it's partly the lower densities and less interactions with planets uh, that you have in the cold Kuiper belt in, in particular, right? So in the asteroids, a lot of the binaries, you right? So you could have formed these binaries originally, they would then get destroyed by the collisions, which happen much more often. And then the binaries you do see are because you're closer to the sun, there's a lot more radiation. And so then radiation forces spin up your asteroid, increase its angular momentum, and then it has to spit out things out in a binary. So it's great, it's a binary, always fun to have binaries in the solar system, but it, it's not telling you as much in the same way about formation. I see, because it was formed as a result of some sort of other interaction as opposed to like by primordial. Exactly, yeah, yeah. It's not, not in the initial formation stage of the gas rich disc, but yes, much later in the game. Okay, cool. So the general picture that you were saying is like the streaming instability or something else is causing these, like you should- Or something like it. There's lots of room for other ideas, yes. But okay. go ahead. <laughs> causing these objects to kind of coagulate or coalesce and they're near each other and then you get some sort of rotation around two and then they slowly shed some of that angular momentum so they get close enough to then form these like or they, they eventually kind of join like um what was the object that was was two lobed was that erikoth that, that was erikoth itself yeah yeah um yeah i guess the uh the um you know again this, this gets somewhat into to jargon and what things are i'd say the Right, the point of the streaming instability and these other things, it's not coagulation, as I would say, which means things actually hitting and sticking. It's just getting things closer together, getting the density high enough. And then once the density is high enough, right, there's just gravitational collapse and it just falls in on itself, which is like everything you do, right? That's how galaxies form and do yeah. it, how stars it's form. It's how most things in the astronomical universe form, but these are, this, this may well be the smallest example in the universe of a gravitational collapse uh, process, um, uh, you know, making something. And so, as you know, if something gravitationally collapses on itself, you don't really need to worry about how it's sticking. It's just, you know, yes, it is colliding and hitting and it's maybe sticking, but it's, if you're forming a gravitationally bound object, that that's your goal. That's what you need to do. Because we see, we see lots of binary star systems or multiple stars that are all gravitationally bound to each other. And we think we understand at some level why that happens, but I guess the main difference then is those are more massive. So there's more gravitational forces holding them together than in a situation like these minor planets like you're dealing with where it's not as, it, it's harder to make them massive enough where the gravity is going to hold them together, but eventually you you get to that stage. Well, uh, you know, I mean, yeah. Well, okay. Well, so here here's where it gets a bit tricky. Obviously, at some level, everything is relative, right? I mean, you can have a binary at sort of any scale, right? So it's really what is the gravity competing with is is the question. And so the issue is that you're in a protoplanetary disk. You know, there's the sun or some other star nearby that's exerting some tidal forces that's preventing, you know, that's what's preventing things from, uh, from coming together and, and falling on themselves. Cool. The cool. same tides that are stretching the earth out. Right? Exactly. Um, okay. A few more questions. Uh, how, well, the, there were a bunch of questions that were all related and that was like, What's the time scale over which uh, these binaries have formed? Like, it, it sounds like, based on your description, that these have been around for a long time. Would they predate a lot of the, the other planetary bodies or are these more recent things? And what's the time scale over which they'll get deorbited and like fall into the interior of the solar system or get disrupted? Like, are we catching them at a specific moment in time or are these long lived stable kind of structures? Um, yeah, yeah, so certainly, uh, you know, in, in this collapse scenario, this is something that's happening, right? When there is the gas rich disk around the young sun, a period of just a few million years, which compared to the several billion years of the solar system is, is a blink in the eye. So this was like the infancy of the solar system when all this stuff was happening. Yeah, yeah. 
And then some of the things that Orian mentioned, right, of the, right, isotopic decays, right, this can be actually used to sort of maybe pinpoint where in that few million years this happened. So in particular, early in the solar system, you have a lot of aluminum 26, right, that is melting, right, and right, they, they can melt these objects. Uh, mm -hmm. And so there, there is some evidence that, right, as you might guess, Kuiper objects are kind of at the edge of the solar system. Planet formation didn't get very far. Things didn't get into giant planets. So it may have been the, the tail end of making these planetesimals. And that's why there's, there's sort of fewer of them there uh, and, and whatnot. And, and, it's, and so it's great that you get all these different lines of evidence to try to um, try to piece that together. I see, okay. Um, and then I think probably the last question that we'll hit is um, how far, and perhaps we don't know, how far away is Arakoth from any other known objects in the Kuiper belt? And is it likely that it'll potentially run into anything else or is it part of a larger system? Is this done hierarchically where you have these two systems that are, that are orbiting and then that's part of a larger one that's also in some sort of binary or... I, uh, so, yeah, yeah, so I, I guess, um, okay, so yeah, I, I can sort of maybe see where that idea came from, certainly seeing Pluto Charon, and then it's got this swarm of other things around it. Um, but basically, you know, it's again, because of this recent region of tides, there's, there's a fairly small region of space where things can be orbiting each other, and obviously depends on how massive they are, how, how big that is. And so then out, outside of that, everything is just going around its orbit, uh, its orbit around the sun, right? Um, so yes, there is some, some average density of, of things. I don't have the number on the top of my head and it wouldn't mean anything to anyone, but the, the important fact is that the, the collision rate is, is quite low. So unlike the, the asteroid belt where things collide often, right? Over the age of the solar system, these objects, you know, on, you know, uh, right? Any object has a, right, uh, Right is is likely to never experience a collision in the uh, in the age of the solar system. Okay. Okay. Interesting. Um, and lastly, trying to tie this into to what Orianne was speaking about and the Geminids in general. Not that this is relevant to us because these Kuiper Belt objects are far much farther away in the outer solar system. But do you think that they're also producing kind of rubble? trails behind them in the same way that we see comets and asteroids doing that in the inner solar system. And that's what we, what the earth travels through when we see a meteor shower. Presumably there's similar behavior in the outer solar system that might be relevant if we ever sent other missions that went into the outer solar system that passed through the, the orbits of one of these objects or. Um, well, that's a good question. I mean, I think with, again, with, with collisions so rare and with radiation so weak, I don't know, you, you can comment, but I, you know, I don't think there's the, yeah, I don't know, the, I mean, you need, right, the, right, the like dust cloud that you get from the asteroid hot. belt is much, much stronger than the dust cloud you certainly get from the Kuiper belt. I think you get more and more from comets. I don't know, Orianne? Yeah, I mean, I agree with you. When you have like some icy bodies, the main process to generate mirror is going to be like sublimation and you need to be close to the sun to do that and you can have of course some of them by fragmentation and collisions i mean for example in the asteroid belt but when you're like so far away it's and just... you know you're having like such location and after you need a lot of time also you have some uh, radiative effects like pointing robertson or something like that that you know with they can like Spiral. I don't know if that word is correct in English, like uh, these particles down and kind of bring them a bit in the inner solar system. But when you're like so far away, I'm not sure that's it's producing really anything. Well. But it's you have this object kicked out by planets and gravitational plays, and then they come into the inner solar system by resonances or things like that. And then they start producing meteorites. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, so what, not, not to make the Kuiper Belt, I don't want to make the Kuiper Belt seem boring, that it's dark and things don't hit. So uh, Pluto does have a seasonal atmosphere, right? So that it's on this very eccentric orbit. And so the atmospheric gases freeze out when it's far from the sun and then sort of thaw and create a, a temporary sort of larger atmosphere. Really? Sort of ventures inside That's the orbit cool. of Neptune. 
or you have some rings, you know, like Shari clothes, you have like some rings that have wrapped around like very small bodies. You have lots of interesting stuff there. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. Cause the difference like Pluto's orbit is pretty eccentric, right? So it, it can both be, you know, 30% closer to the sun or something on that order, which is a huge difference in terms of the surface temperature. Yeah, yeah, no, I mean it, it crosses the orbit of Neptune. It goes goes inside and outside, but uh, but it will never hit because it's, it is uh, protected by the three to two orbital resonance. resonance. Interesting. Okay, cool. Well, excellent talk. Thank you very much, and thank you for uh, answering both our audience's questions as well as my dumb questions. So I, I very much appreciate it. Um, okay, get, get so, your galaxies out of our solar system. Yeah, I know. I like that you called. I, I like that you called the galaxies Berman. <laughs> um, okay, cool. So uh, now, uh, as Kaylin would put it, this is the third half of our Astronomy on Tap events, the the pub trivia component, and I tried to assemble a, a pub trivia. Let's see if I am able to pull it off here. Um, if I share my screen. Let's see, which window is it? It's this window. Okay, so audience members are, uh, well, I guess I'm already showing the first question, but at the top of the screen, what you should be able to see is um, a website, menti.com, and then following it up with uh, this code that you can enter on. So just bring up a web browser or use your phone. And if you go to this, it should give us kind of a live um, interaction with what you're putting in as your answers for our questions on, on this website during the presentation, during our event right now, live. So, um, so I encourage everybody to go to this website and check it out and try and, and try and run it. And the first question is, what national park in the contiguous, the 48, lower 48 US, has the darkest skies for stargazing? And we've already started getting some answers. <laughs> we've got Death Valley. Someone suggests that they cheated and looked up uh, an answer to Great Basin National Park. Yeah, I encourage people to not cheat, but obviously I, I, can't, uh, I can't scold you in person. There's also no prizes associated with our public. You, you show your screen, it's not, it was not actively cheating. <laughs> oh, did I show that? Oh, I showed the, oh yeah, no. You put a I just saw the next slide. That's why I am confused. Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> well, hopefully this is the only question people can cheat on then. <laughs> So we're seeing a few different options. Uh, Badlands, uh, Joshua Tree, Great Basin, Death Valley, Grand Canyon, all excellent places. And in fact, many of these places um, have, have dark sky festivals that take place at them where you can go. I mean, obviously not right now during the pandemic, but during a normal time, you could go and set, uh, there will be people giving lectures and people setting up telescopes and you can go view the sky from these sites. Um, I know Sequoia, Kings Canyon does this. I know Grand Canyon does this. I know Death Valley does this. So I encourage you to check those, check those out at some point. Someone just added Cherry Springs. Um, but the answer, as far, as far as I could tell, uh, was Great Basin National Park, which is in like central Nevada, and Big Bend National Park, which is in uh, West Texas near the Mexican border. So the, the map that's seen here is, is taken from the website that I include down here. You can just look up dark sky map. There are a variety of different websites that try and, and show the, the um, light pollution map of both the United States as well as the globe. And obviously you can see based on this map that the Eastern half of the United States has a lot of people and it has a lot of light pollution. So you generally, if you want to do decent stargazing, you want to go to the Western half where it's a bit darker skies because there are fewer people and fewer cities. And it turns out that the two national parks, Death Valley is in fact a wonderful place to go, but it is not in fact the darkest um, 
although it was wonderful the last couple of nights, but Great Basin and Big Bend are actually the darkest. So I encourage you guys, I haven't been to either of those parks. I really want to go. Um, and I encourage you basically whenever you have the opportunity to go to uh, Great Sand Dunes is also very good in Colorado, but going to national parks in general will get you to dark skies where oftentimes they have telescopes and they have some, some events that take place in the evening that can, um, uh, you know, highlight some of the, the cool things in the sky. So check them out. Okay. What kind of, uh, question number two, what kind of astronomical event uh, are the Simpsons viewing? And I think for this one, we have a few. So this is a, this is a, um, from the Simpsons television program. And, and I, I believe this is a multiple choice. Let's see what people are saying. Oh, yes. So they're either watching a meteor shower, sporadic meteors, the invasion of Kang and Kodos, or it looks like they're looking at Ned Flanders' house. So maybe they're just looking across the street at their, their neighbor, Ned Flanders. And this question was, uh, was contributed by Ochien. So I will let her describe the, the, the situation. Yeah, actually, there's a trick here. You're saying a lot of mirrors, so they're not sporadic mirrors. Sporadic mirrors, you would see maybe eight, 10, you know, per hour during a normal night. The so sporadic but, meteors are just meteors that are happening from some random, their source is some random object and they've just, they're just hitting us. Actually, yeah, it's just that they're like so old probably that you cannot connect them anymore to any parent body. They have evolved in the solar system for a long time. Okay. So these are not sporadics, but they're not coming from a, re a radiant, as I explained. So here, that's a mistake from the Simpson. You're not looking at a meteor shower. I don't know what's that. So I personally guess that's an alien invasion. But yep, <laughs> that was a tricky question. Curtis. All right, we will. <laughs> yes, so exactly. It, it doesn't look like... Um, because the radiant is where they're all appearing to come from. And that video was showing them coming from all weird directions. It wasn't really a true meteor shower, right? Yeah. Okay, okay. So, all right. Yeah, kind of a trick question. Sorry guys, but we wanted to clarify how the writers of The Simpsons, who are usually incredibly accurate with their science, um, kind of messed up on that one. All right, next question. A prominent 19th century astrophysicist held that stars were quote unquote, unquestionably clouds of incandescent stones. And he later founded what scientific journal? So there are a few different options for this particular one. Uh, the various different options are science, nature, the astrophysical journal, Icarus, which is a planetary science uh, journal and the monthly notices of the Royal Astronomical Society. So I'll give a few minutes, or maybe not a few minutes, a few moments for people to respond to this particular one. Unquestionably, unquestionably clouds of incandescent stones, which of course is inconsistent with our current view of stars being made of hot gas as opposed to hot stones. Uh, so it can, this is a case where a, a little bit of knowledge can can hurt you, right? He saw spectral lines, which looked kind of like spectral lines from comets. Right. And then drew the conclusion that, aha, uh -huh, this must be like swarms of comets far away. Right, exactly. <laughs> so shall we reveal, reveal the answer? The answer well, I'll let you explain this, Andrew, because you were the one who provided this question. Um, yeah, yeah, no. So this this was uh, Sir Norman Lockyer, who uh, went on to found the the journal Nature, and it's kind of amusing because in in our field, Nature is the journal that's known for having sort of bold ideas that might not turn out to be correct, and so indeed, its founder was someone who had an incredibly bold idea that uh, turned out to be quite wrong. <laughs> <laughs> 
Uh, yeah. But he also he also did great work in his career. I mean, he's one of the first people to discover, I think, the helium line in this in the sun. So again, it was you know great observations he was doing, but you know some uh, sometimes data can lead you astray. Indeed, indeed, I like that. What all good theorists say, right? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> okay, last week, which country? became the second nation to plant its flag on the surface of the moon. Any ideas on this one? Whoa, okay. A couple of, a couple of spellings of China, some accurate, some less accurate. <laughs> Okay, I guess people are generally, generally in consensus that China is the, is the correct answer here. And indeed, it is. Uh, the, there was a mission uh, last week that landed on the moon, in the, on the near side of the moon, in what's known as the, the, sea, or the ocean of storms, the Okeanus Procolarum. So this mission called Chang'e, uh, five is the, the fifth in this series. So the last two have landed on the moon, but this one actually landed, collected some samples, and then shot them back in a capsule that's going to land on the Earth. Um, I don't think it has yet landed on the Earth, but it will soon. And as part of this mission, China also erected this little flag, um, which is only about a foot and a half tall. So it's not, you know, like... Armstrong and Aldrin assembling their flag on the surface during the Apollo missions, but it is the, the second nation to successfully do this sort of thing uh, by actually placing, erecting an actual flag. So the Soviets uh, with the Luna and the Lunacod missions did have Soviet, the Soviet flag painted on the craft that landed on the moon. So essentially, in fact, one of those predated the Apollo mission landing there. So it did actually have a Soviet flag on the moon, but it wasn't actually a flag. It was like painted on a capsule or something like that. Whereas this is actually a flag that was erected. So uh, some level of nationalistic pride, uh, which is always associated with flag planting uh, was, uh, was acquired by China last week. So let's see, what's, what's our next question? You know, is that a, I can't tell, is, is that a fabric flag or, I mean, it it's, it's obviously no gravity, but it is a fabric. They, they kind of brag about how this fabric, the color won't degrade regardless of the temperature and the fabric won't, it's a special fabric that won't wrinkle and all of this stuff. And it's like, okay, guys, you know, it's a flag. It's cool. But anyway, flags. Oh, and, and uh, I only learned this today, Chang E the mission is the Chinese goddess of the moon, which seems obviously appropriate, but I think it's pretty cool. So, and I learned how to pronounce that uh, today for this from a native Mandarin speaker. So I was, I went through my steps and didn't just mangle it. I mean, I'm still probably mangling the pronunciation, but at least less mangling the pronunciation of, of the mission. Okay. Uh, later this month, what two planets will align in the sky to form their closest conjunction in about 800 years. And aside from someone putting in Kalen and Cameron, which is probably not, not accurate, uh, um, the, the, the overwhelming, what else? Have we, yeah, I guess more people are putting Kalen and Cameron now. Okay, cool, very cool. Um, Pluto, Mercury, our options here, Jupiter and Saturn are the overwhelming uh, winners in your guys' answers. Sharon, very good. Someone was paying attention, Andrew, during your, your presentation and Pluto and Sharon being, being aligned for their closest conjunction. Although I don't think we knew about either Pluto or Sharon until less than a hundred years ago, but but that doesn't mean they couldn't have been conjoined at some point in the distant yeah, past. It's the magic of dynamical astronomy. We can calculate where they would have been. I don't think, it, yeah. 
That's right. When do you know uh, when? I mean, I I know Pluto itself was discovered what nineteen thirty five. But do you know when Charon and the other bodies associated with Pluto were actually discovered? Were they discovered when Pluto was discovered? Do you know? Yeah, yes, uh, I should know this better. Yeah, so Pluto was discovered right at uh, Lowell Observatory uh, yeah. here, here being Northern me, Arizona. Being in Arizona. Right. Um, I right. thought it was 35, Clyde Tombaugh. Clyde but Tombaugh. Yeah. So I think, yeah, no, it, it took a little while longer for Sharon, uh, probably not not much. And then those tiny moons, right? That really, that took the, that's very recent. Very recent, okay. Cool. Okay, so as most people have guessed, aside from the joke Cameron and Kalen answers, uh, Jupiter and Saturn are in fact the correct answers. Um, so they haven't been so close in the sky. And when I say in the sky, this is a projection effect, right? It isn't that those two planets are actually getting close together and going to somehow gravitationally interact. It's that on the sky, their projected location is close, but their physical distance is still quite large. It's just they happen to appear on the sky right next to each other. And as you can see from this uh, image that I stole from some news source, the first alert storm team, uh, it shows the locate the relevant the relative location of both Jupiter and Saturn on the sky over the course of the, the last few weeks and leading up until December 21st, when they will be approximately 0.1 degree apart. Now for reference, the size of the disk of the full moon is about half a degree, 0.5 degrees. So they will be one fit like rel uh, relatively like one fifth the distance of the full moon apart from each other. So quite, quite close. And I know this is being played up and sensationalized all over media because everyone loves this sort of thing. Eh, it's kind of cool to see a couple of bright spots in the sky that are right next to each other. Is it blowing your mind? Eh, not so much, but you know, people got to sell newspapers. So, uh, you know, it's cool to see, I guess. You can do uh, nice pictures with nice optics, astrophotography. Yeah, that's true. Um, I like meteor showers. I like aurorae. I like so, uh, total solar eclipses. I think those are truly like really cool, but this is, it's all right. It's better than a super moon. I'll give you that. It's better than a super moon. Super moon is garbage. I hate the super moon. Anyway. Uh, the, the part of this that I, so two things. First, uh, I had a update that Sharon was uh, discovered in uh, 1978. Uh, so there you go. Oh, and okay, cool. uh, for the, the conjunction, the part I thought was cool is right. You can, but again, we astronomers can say when these things will happen, have happened and will happen anytime in human history, right? That's true. So like if you were to have some painting or some book where it described, you know, described how close Jupiter and Saturn were on the night sky, right? Astronomers could go back and, you know, say, you know, uh, you know, specific dates, you know, when that, when that happened. Right? Well, that is cool. Like um, being able to look at, uh, oh, there's a, Okay, and you're you're French. What's the the famous um, tapestry in Normandy that depicts William the Conqueror coming to 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 England? Um, the Bayeux the Bayeux tapestry, and it has Halley's Comet on it. And you're like, oh, yeah. oh holy cow! So it's it's a it. Then astronomers can go and look and be like, oh, actually, yeah, Halley's Comet. We we can deduce that the comet that's shown in the Bayeux tapestry actually is Halley's Comet because we know the orbital period of this object and we know when it should have been here. And I think that's super cool. Yeah, exactly. Actually, I made a whole analysis of Halley and that lasted during one year. I just published that recently uh, during this summer. And we're also using very ancient Chinese observations of the year, like 240 BC. And actually, it's just only thanks to these all observations, when you see this very bright comet, even during the daylight, you have also paintings and information about that, that we're able to trace back the motion of this comet with accuracy during three millennia. Wow. And that's 
because for comets it's really hard because you have all this outgassing process, non-gravitational forces that change with time. And so after a few revolutions, it's really hard to be absolutely certain of where the comet was. And so these ancient observations in meter science have a lot of value for us. That's awesome. That's so do observations for the future generations. <laughs> That's super awesome. Uh, so yeah, if we're, if we're gonna if we're gonna go on this kick, I know I mentioned she's obviously like any decent uh, halfway decent astronomer or planetary person loves uh, loves chasing eclipses, right? The right the the length of day has obviously changed due to tides in a somewhat random way. So like while so while astronomers can predict like exactly when solar eclipses occur actually exactly where that path crosses the earth uh, depends on the change in the length of, of day, right? So that, that, right, you can get that history of the earth moon system by from historical records of eclipses and, and where they happened. That, that, yeah, that's super cool. Um, it's nice to have this historical point of view. I know a guy, a researcher, who is going to Maya temples, trying to like find tracks of these astronomical events because yes, they're useful information about what the solar system looked like and what events we saw on Earth like very a long time ago. So yeah, yeah. It's, our, it's not just not astronomy; it's history, sociology, <laughs> psychology, yeah. religion. It's a bit of everything. Exactly. All right. Um, I will share my screen again for our next question. Uh, next question. On what we go, there's always a Star Wars question that I try to incorporate here. And in this particular one, it's, it was actually mentioned during the talk. On what desert planet is Luke Skywalker raised in the Star Wars uh, universe? It seems like people are getting it pretty, pretty accurately. Um, and what's special about this particular planet is that it is a, a planet that orbits a binary star system. Uh, oh, interesting spelling and Klingon. Oh, no, some Star Trek fans here corrupting our, corrupting our responses. <laughs> Um, yeah, so the, the correct answer and yeah, I appreciated Andrew that you, you didn't want to break copyright. I did, of course, I'm hoping that I can avoid any kind of jail time by properly crediting Lucasfilm and Disney on this particular image of Luke Skywalker. I don't, on I don't, I don't think he cares about his citation count. He just wants, <laughs> he wants the money. <laughs> Yeah. And actually, you can visit this place. It's in Tunisia. Tunisia. It's called Tatawin, and there's a there has been a meteorite fall there. Like uh, I don't know which here, so I have a piece of meteorite from Tatawin here. Really? <laughs> yeah. Oh, cool. That's super cool. Yeah. So, um, is it stable for a planet to orbit dynamically stable for a planet to orbit around two stars, as is depicted in as Tatooine orbiting around a binary system? binary stellar system? Um, so you, you cannot, a uh, planet cannot orbit as stably as close to a binary star as it obviously can from a single star. A single star, you're basically always stable. The only question is what tides will do to you. Um, but yeah, there's, there's a zone of instability around a binary star that you have to be outside of. And then some of the resonant locations are, are, are issues as well. Um, but, but there is a possibility, like there is not just a possibility. Kepler planets. has discovered circumbinary planets. This is okay. a known, yeah, <laughs> it's a known thing. You yeah. just have to be far enough out that you kind of it approximates yeah. the gravitational force from the two as a single object, and so it just orbits around that kind of central. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, it just, it just has to right the right the the. Th problem of three bodies undergoing gravitational interactions, right? Does not in general, right? It does not, 
right? It's not like the two body problem. There's not a closed solution, right? right. So some, <laughs> some, you know, some situations are stable, others are unstable. So the further you get away, then it, yes, it, it gets more like the two body problem, but it, it doesn't have to be completely like the two body problem to be stable. It can just jostle you a bit and you're still fine. Okay. Can we have these planets like at Lagrange positions? Oh. Stars? Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. So it's like co co-orbital planets, you mean, basically. Yeah, yeah. The, I, I thought there, yeah, I mean, I, I think that's, I mean, they, there are obviously small bodies that are in horseshoe orbits around the Earth. I, I don't know if there's a limit on how big such an object could be. Um, yeah. That's cool, though. Yeah, I like that idea. Lagrange. Can I, can I just complain about how devoid of imagination uh, George Lucas was? I mean, there's like, each planet was just like a single climate zone on Earth, <laughs> right? Like, oh, let's have a desert planet and a jungle. Ice planet, desert planet, volcano planet. Like, I know. It, I don't know. Like science fiction is supposed to like, I don't know, break new ground in some way. <laughs> but not in that particular. <laughs> All right. Back to the quiz. Um, when an interstellar comet crosses Earth's orbit on its way through the solar system, so interstellar meaning that it's not bound to the, Earth, or to the sun or to the solar system, how many times faster than the Earth must it be traveling? So this is kind of a, a tricky question. I mean, not so much tricky, it just, there is an analytic solution to this. Um, and yeah, I think it's kind of an interesting problem. Got some, some good answers here. And we have an example of this that there are two examples, in fact, um, that have been discovered in the last, what, two years, I think. Um, there was Comet Borisov maybe six, eight months ago, 10 months ago, and there was uh, um, uh, yeah, I'm going to mess up the pronunciation. <laughs> um, um, that's that crazy shape looking uh, asteroid that, that came in from, from outside of the solar system and flew through and is on its way out again. So we've got a, a diversity of, of answers here from our audience. Um, yeah, all sorts of stuff. So the same speed as Earth, a little bit faster, a lot bit faster, or a lot, lot bit faster. And there seems no clear consensus. Uh, Andrew, you had offered this as our quiz question. I appreciate for the, the, the suggestion. Would you like to, uh, to uh, our answer, as I've displayed, is 1.4, which is approximately the, the square root of 2. And the image that we're showing here is Oumuamua, this um, interstellar asteroid that kind of flew through our solar system. Do you want to talk about it at all, Andrew? I'll, I'll unmute first. Um, yes, yeah, I, I don't know what, uh, let's see, what to say. I mean, basically the, um, right, it's basically the difference between the speed of an object on a circular orbit, right, and the speed something needs if you were to launch it and get it out of the solar system. The escape right? velocity, right? Um, and so that, uh, right, that diff, well, there's, what, what, what's the reason, right? So in one, the, uh, right, I don't know how technical we can get here, right? There, there are two forms of energy that something in an orbit has. It has its kinetic energy of motion and it has its potential energy of, of where it is. Right. So for something to escape out to infinity, it has to have zero energy. So those two have to be equal. Mm -hmm. uh, but then there's this famous thing called the Virial theorem that says, well, actually, with the uh, um, right kinetic energy is only uh, half the absolute value of the potential energy. And so since kinetic energy is velocity squared, you get that. Uh, uh, you get that square root of that too, giving you the, the 1.4 yeah, to the math. Excellent.
And I so think that's also why I say that most of the meters have velocity between 11.2 actually and 72.8 kilometers per second because one is due to the, let's say the, the liberation speed from Earth and the other one from the solar system. We might have some interstellar meteorites, but most of them we're seeing come from the solar system. So you know that the Earth is going more or less at 30 kilometers per second and to like go away from the solar system, it's maybe you need maybe to I, I sorry, add 42, I think that's 42 kilometers per second. So if you just do the ratio between 42 and 30, you also find this 1.4, which is logical, right? Uh -huh. yeah. yeah, yeah, no, I mean, that's it. And so that uh, 11 kilometers is saying, saying it's just the right, not the speed to get kicked out of the solar system, but just the speed that, right, you, right, to get launched off of Earth or inversely the speed if you just fall onto Earth that you have to have, right, so that, 11 kilometers per second is less than the, right, 30 kilometers per second of going around the sun. This is why the Earth can't, you know, kick comets out of the solar system. It's only something like Jupiter, where its orbital speed is, right, uh, is, is smaller than its, the speed with its escape speed from the surface that it can kick things out from. Right, only Jupiter can do that heavy lifting. That's interesting. So the Earth, if we gravitationally perturb some asteroid that passes near us, we can't launch that out of the solar system. Only Jupiter, could, could Saturn, is Saturn massive enough to fling something that gets close to it out? Um, I mean, at some point it gets down to rates, right? Because it's like, oh, could it do it if it passed within, you know, a meter of the surface? But then that's, that's less likely. So the, the fact is that Jupiter does it the best. And so it does it almost all the time. Okay. Interesting. Um, so what do you guys think? I, I know um, Avi Loeb at Harvard has written a paper about, I mean, he writes a lot of, he's kind of like that nature guy. Um, uh, writes a lot of kind of highly suggestive papers, but that could also, I mean, they're, they're interesting ideas, but they may not be, they may not actually be the, the accurate solution for what's going on. And he wrote a paper and, and still tightly holds, at least in the media, that Oumuamua, this asteroid coming in from the, the interstellar space, is actually potentially an alien craft or alien ship or something like that. What what are your guys' opinions on Oumuamua? Well, that's a different question. You say, what are your opinions on him? We don't have to say anything about Avi Loeb if you ask what our questions that's are. That's true. That's true. That is. True. <laughs> I don't. Well, I don't want to. I don't want to be too suggestive and ask your opinions on Avi Loeb. After you know, publications are something different. Uh, I mean, there have been, for example, scientific pub uh, publications just saying that uh, the way Humuamua behaves is maybe because it's like a kind of a cloud of dust that, you know, because there were like some non-gravitational forces that weren't really well understood in the, the object motion. So you have also other explanation with part of these like aggregate um, being lost and after the thing fragmented. I mean, I don't know the person who are talking, you're talking about has seen some of the publications, especially one when he was talking about these mirrors that were like, um, you know, you have some mirrors that don't fall, I mean, don't fall into the atmosphere. I mean, they're like so, um, I don't know, say like great grazing events, yeah. but actually they just enter a bit in the atmosphere and then they just go back into space. They just bump like that in the atmosphere. And he was suggesting that these mirrors actually can collect viruses, virus and like uh, some life in the upper layer of the atmosphere and maybe inseminate other planets, interstellar objects. And it was like, I think it was one of his students. And these things are like highly controversial because yes. there's proof of is, life in very the controversial. Earth. Yeah, it's like a lot of heating and you know, a lot of things. So I think personally, I, I don't know nothing about that. I think it's great to have these kind of ideas and share them because we need to be open-minded and to like look a bit, you know, beyond what science, but after we need to be very careful in what we're saying and distinguish the facts and the opinion when you're talking as a researcher. Absolutely. I agree with everything that you just said. It's, <laughs> it's very creative and comes up with a lot of good ideas, but they may not be plausible or reasonable in the end. 
Well, I guess I say, go ahead and say that, right? There's, right, it, it's great to entertain what you might want to call out there ideas, right? But I guess I'd say they're, they're out there ideas that are, that are interesting <laughs> and they're out there ideas that are not interesting. And to me, just saying it's aliens to everything is, is not particularly interesting anymore. There's really, there's really nowhere to go with that, right? There's not, not much to follow up on unless, you know, they start talking to you, right? So, you know, I think the, I know someone who came up with a sort of out there, but more interesting idea for Oumuamua. So one of the things, you, you know, Orin is mentioning a lot of the, the things, but one of the, the crazy constraints uh, um, is that, right, there, there's no detected cometary tail or anything coming off of this thing, which is sort of quite surprising for, for many of those scenarios. Um, so, uh, so someone I you know happen to know uh, quite well, a recent uh, recent graduate uh, of Yale, Daryl Seligman, who worked with Greg Laughlin. Some people may know if, if they know exoplanets. Um, but I had the idea that the object was a hydrogen iceberg. So it's a frozen block of hydrogen uh, that. Um, on its travel through space, it sort of evaporated and they sort of made an analogy with bars of soap that as you use a bar of soap, it naturally becomes more spindly and gets an elongated uh, axis. It's just sort of the reverse process of, oh, if you inflate something, it becomes more round. If you wear something away, it becomes less round. Uh, that any inequality becomes more exaggerated. It's a pretty... Um, you know, clean argument for at least that part of it. Um, but yeah, so needless to say, that's, uh, that, that's a hard thing to prove, but there are at least some consequences of something being made of hydrogen that you can start investigating and, and testing and things like that. Yeah, I like that. I wasn't aware of that argument, so. Okay, uh, we will get back to the quiz here. Only a, a, a couple more left. Oops. What space observatory run by the European Space Agency just released the positions and velocities of 1.8 billion stars in the Milky Way? Actually, they this was a, a secondary data release, so they, they added some, and now they have a total of 1.8 billion stars for the positions and velocities and colors of these stars in the Milky Way, but... Um, there's the suggestion of Gaia. There's another suggestion of Gaia. <laughs> Maybe I'm making these questions too easy. But uh, I think that's either a you don't know it or you know it one. Yeah, yeah perhaps. Yeah. Maybe I should make it multiple choice and throw in some red herrings into yeah. it. Alma. Okay, yeah. Alma. That's a good. That's a good. That's a good suggestion. That's not. Gaia. <laughs> so yes, the answer, I, I don't need to play this out. Um, ooh, Gaia, In, interesting, excellent, okay. <laughs> the answer is indeed Gaia. Um, this is an image that was circling around the internet the last week or so. There's a movie associated with it. I'm not allowed to post uh, movies here as easily. And um, it's essentially took something like 4,000 random stars that were included in the Gaia data release and showed their full trajectory over the next, you know, thousand years or something like that and where they'd be, where they would be. Um, of course, the, the line in the back, the, the structure in the back is our Milky Way galaxy, which is mostly planar when viewed from this particular uh, projection. But yeah, I mean, Gaia has done leaps and bounds in terms of, of enabling a variety of different types of science to be done about the galactic structure and the evolution of our own galaxy, the Milky Way, because it has such um, precise positions and velocities associated with these individual stars throughout our galaxy. And you can really, you can identify both structures, much like what you guys were talking about for our solar system, but on a much larger scale, our galaxy, you can identify structures of old galaxies that merged with us and left their kind of trails of debris in the same way that 
asteroids might break up and leave trails of debris in the form of meteoroids that will travel through as the earth. And um, yeah, it's, it's, been, it's been a huge boon to the field of astrophysics, this, uh, this Gaia space satellite. So it's super cool. Okay, I will go back to this, finish off our quiz. What prominent planetary scientist just became the president of the Planetary Society? And for reference, the Planetary Society is this uh, nonprofit organization that is actually based in Pasadena. It's not far from here. It's not far from Caltech. It promotes um, exploration and understanding of, the, of, of our solar system. The, the CEO of the Planetary Society is Bill Nye, Bill Nye the science guy. So Sagan potentially isn't the worst answer, although Carl Sagan has been dead for over two decades, so it's probably they don't want a post-mortem president. But um, as, a, as a hint, this planetary scientist is, is in fact a professor at Caltech. And Mike Brown is not the correct answer, although Mike Brown is a planetary, prominent planetary sci scientist who's a professor at Caltech, who's um, Oh, Bethany something. Okay. Okay. That's, that's, that's an option. <laughs> People are, we're getting some decent answers here. Um, I'll wait another moment in case anyone, anyone knows or anyone cheat knows. Emily Lakdawalla is in fact an employee at Planetary, uh, at, uh, Planetary Society. She writes a number of articles um, we, we went to college together. It is a very small, it's the same small college, uh, Amherst College. It's a small world. You went to school with Emily? Uh, yeah, yeah. She studied geology, not physics. Oh, really? So oh, cool. Didn't know her that well. Oh, but, that's funny. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, she, um, she spoke at one of our Astronomy on Taps that was in person before the, before the pandemic and before I started recording them and putting them on, on, online. But um, yeah, she's a great speaker. All right, so the answer is in fact, Bethany something. Um, uh, the, the answer is Bethany Elman. Uh, she, she, she gave one of our stargazing lectures a couple of years ago on the object series in the asteroid belt, the largest of the, the asteroids in the asteroid belt. And she actually has a really cool uh, mission that was just AOK'd by NASA called the Lunar Trailblazer mission that is going to orbit around the moon for a period of year uh, of a year and study the location of lunar water water sources and hydroxyl which of course has been in the news a lot and is really relevant to the potential for going to the moon again um, and potentially starting some sort of settlement or base but also studying not just the location of it but the um how much it changes over the course of a lunar day. Like, do you have some here and then maybe later in the day it goes away or has less or evaporates or sublimates or whatever. So it looks like a really interesting uh, mission. And, and she was honored by being, by being the, the president, which is super cool, I think. Okay. And, she, and ag again, she's, she's a professor at Caltech, which is, which is also pretty sweet. Okay. Um, I think this is our final question. What is the parent body responsible for the Geminids meteor shower that's happening right now, as we've talked about? I won't reply now. <laughs> yeah, you, 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 don't, you don't get to answer. Sagan, another answer, just like the last question. Sagan, the parent body that's dispersing thousands, if not millions of meteoroids into the upper atmosphere causing the Geminid meteor shower? Actually not a comet. <laughs> That's true. That is true. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> wow, people, people are loving, loving oh, seeing. Yeah. <laughs> I think, uh, this is what happens when you have a drinking astronomy of Event, right? <laughs> yeah. Gonna 
It's like play more Skinnerd, <laughs> play Freebird. <laughs> People may not know. I'll, I'll admit that I didn't know a priori either. The moon. Ooh, that'd be a good one. That's a good question, Orian. Does does the moon uh, ever shed on any of its of its regolith that might be trailing behind it? Like if an object were to pass through the orbit of the moon, would it encounter? Oh, Avi Loeb. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, that was me. <laughs> <laughs> Would it encounter any kind of meteoroids that were shed from regolith that was kicked off the surface of the moon? <laughs> Actually, you have some uh, impacts of meteoroids on the moon that can just, you know, like eject some small material. Mm. I don't think they're like reaching us. We have uh, lunar meteorites, so. so we have some rocks from the moon that reached us. I, I think it's because of impacts. Mm. But, uh, we have rocks from Mars that have reached us as well. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Okay, the most, most popular answer is Ochien knows. So, oh, there's oh, the good one. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Phaethon. So yes, indeed, Phaethon is the, is the, is the correct answer. Um, this was uh, a, a GIF taken from the Wikipedia article. Um, showing it traveling through the solar system. Do you, do you want to add anything about this, uh, this object, Orianne? Yeah, yeah, actually, it's, uh, Gemini's are a very interesting shower and very complicated to model because Phaethon is an asteroid. It might have been like um, a, a dead comet, so a comet that just stopped uh, sublimating. It's possible. We see some activity from Phaethon, so we see some uh, ejection of material, but just not enough now to explain the Geminids showers because we see a lot of meteors, but uh, we don't have like a lot of ejections from Phaethon. So we're suspecting that a very strong event occurred like maybe 1000 ago and that the Geminid stream was created then and that we're still seeing the effects now. But Phaethon is an interesting body, super close. It, I mean, it goes super close to the sun too. It's one of the asteroids that has the lowest, what we call the perihelion distance. So yeah, I think it's like 0.3 AU. So it's a oh, very wow. peculiar object. Yeah. And so yeah, actually, most of the like comets. To... Oh, sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. No, you go yeah, ahead. Actually, there's yeah, a suspicion that, you know, uh, comets and bodies that have like even lower per helium distance get like super catastrophic disruption close to the sun. And this one is not, I mean, it's right at the limit. And it's a, yeah, it's a very peculiar body. And so you have like, a, there's a space mission uh, that will, I don't know which year is gonna reach Faven, but in like, uh, yeah, a lot of time, like six years or something, which is called Destiny Plus. And one of, uh, maybe Andrew knows, I don't know, but one of the, the goal of this mission is also to, to, to study Phaethon and the Geminids and if you have dust there. So yeah, very interesting and complex body. <laughs> very cool. Um, okay, I think, Research. I think that was, I think that was the last question. Let me double check, make sure I didn't. Uh... Oh yeah, that's the end of it. Okay, I wasn't sure. <laughs> that was the end of the the uh, the, the, uh, the pub trivia. Destiny Plus will be launched in 2024. And it'll land on Phaethon. No, it's not going to land. I think it's going to do like a kind of flyby. There's like optical devices there, maybe a spectrometer and there's no 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 lander landing like <laughs> for Hayabusa or Philae. Okay, cool. Um, I guess we didn't even talk about. I know we're past time. I'll make this quick. We didn't even talk about the solar eclipse that happened this weekend um, in South America. Presumably, you guys didn't get to attend. I didn't attend. I was in Death Valley. Um, hopefully, maybe one of our viewers did. Uh, solar eclipses, total solar eclipses are really breathtaking and I highly recommend any uh, viewers, the if they ever have the opportunity to see one, that they should go to see one. Um, but we will give you a, a, a long, uh, you know, layout before one happens to let you know the details of the next one. I think the next one that's reasonably viewable for most of our viewers is um, What's the one that crosses the continental United States? Is that 2023? 
I think. Oh, I should know this. Um, I thought it was 2023. Uh, yeah, it, it's it's coming. Yeah, maybe oh, a little further. 2020. Maybe a little longer. Yeah. Um, so, you know, it's safe here. We're talking about all these missions. Where, where's the love for Osiris Rex here? Did I did I miss the uh, astronomy oh, yeah. on tap? Were you? Yeah, we we talked we talked a bit about uh, Osiris Rex. I haven't had any of the Osiris Rex uh, scientists who've come on to talk about. Uh, not what I do, but I've, I've got connections here, right? Okay. Um, I will I will hit you up and we will get one. You too, obviously you were here. Uh, Sorry, we'll just to ask too. for you, the solar eclipse is going to be in 2024, April oh. 8th. Perfect, perfect. Okay. Okay, well, uh, thank you, both of you, Orien and Andrew. Excellent presentations. Thank you for sitting through my, my silly trivia questions. And thank you, audience, for, for, for sticking with us. Um, Again, the Geminids are happening at this moment. So if you have the opportunity to go outside and view them from as dark a place as possible, but if that's your backyard and you just want to go out and you live in the suburbs or even in the city, just make your best attempt to get out in your backyard. Don't look at a bright light for 15, 20 minutes, and then just kind of look up in as best a view of you have of the, of the sky probably is best in kind of the Eastern sky because the Geminids will be rising around now, uh, or Gemini will be rising where they will appear to come. And just just try and try and see what you can see. You might see a fireball, you might see a smaller one, but um, but it's cool. Meteor showers are actually pretty cool. Whereas this Jupiter Saturn conjunction, eh, it's kind of it's kind it's better than a supermoon. So you know what are you gonna do? Anyway, um, all of our events will be posted. Uh, in the next couple of weeks for, for January and uh, have a, a good holidays, everyone. And we will be back. We will be back uh, in January. So, all right. Merry Thanks Christmas. Cameron. Stay holidays. safe, everyone. Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much.